Hello, uh, you are uh, listening to the class of the uh, CS482. Today we'll talk about ray tracing. I'm the uh, main instructor of this course, Song Yun. So uh, still I have the uh, eye problem. So I have to the, uh, I have to use sunglasses and then continue on the, uh, the today lecture. <laughs> yeah, please understand that somehow I cannot, I cannot, I cannot see the screen uh, that much uh, due to my eye problem. Hopefully it gets better as, uh, as we have more classes. These are the today class objectives. So uh, I wish that at the end of this class, I hope that you can understand the basic ray tracing. And then you know the each acceler acceleration data structure and how to use it. So the today materials will be covered, uh, uh, the today materials already covered in the uh, uh, chapter 10 of my book. Uh, my, uh, basically the, if you, uh, uh, you can see the, this, the, the rendering book, the, the link here. Uh, let's see that. If you click the, this one, I think that the, uh, you can see the, you can, you can get the PDF of the, this the rendering book. So in the, uh, in the uh, lecture, uh, in the video, I will uh, briefly talk about the main idea. But if you're interested uh, on the topic and if you know the more details about the lecture material, I, I, I recommend you to go over the, the, uh, this the, uh, uh, text of the book. So before we moving on to the ray tracing, I'd like to talk about the classic rendering pipeline. If you took the undergraduate computer graphics, you already know that this the rendering pipeline, also known as the, this uh, rasterization. So there are, in the rasterization rendering pipeline, there are many different steps here, right? Starting from, uh, basically starting, uh, it starts from the modeling transformation. So uh, every single model defined in the, its own modeling space. And then we somehow translate, transform, rotate it, and position uh, position each individual model in the uh, at some at some at some po position in the 3D scene. So that's the uh, modeling transformation. Also, we can reject the, some of the trivial objects, maybe the, that are located the, uh, outside of the diffuse uh, 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 There could be the many acceleration techniques. And then one uh, and then we need to illuminate. In other words, we need to compute the color, assuming that the, the, each triangle receives some energy from the light source. And then we uh, we perform the viewing transformation so that uh, such that uh, basically there we uh, here we look at the this scene through the this camera and viewing transformation is nothing but we transform each individual vertex uh, 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 such that this the, the uh, arbitrary camera orient uh, camera frame uh, actually the align into the, the sum of canonical uh, canonical space like the the x x axis of the camera are, are aligned with the, this, the, the canonical x axis, uh, which known as which is actually one uh, one comma uh, one comma zero and zero and zero, something like that, right? So and then basically there you can see that uh, then we do the uh, we do the actually clipping. At that point we know that what are the uh, we, uh, some of the triangle maybe the outside of the uh, outside of the this the, uh, viewing space, and then we need to clip some of the triangle. And we project here in this case, we actually, this is actually camera origin. And then uh, here we are looking through the, this 3D scene, through the, this camera space, camera here. And the project is nothing but we, we actually project all the 3D, 3D, uh, 3D position into the uh, 2D location, 2D position into this camera space. And then with the rasterization, rasterization is nothing but we, we transform this triangle into the sum of the, uh, here actually, this is actually the, uh, our 2D image space and then this little dot actually uh, represent the center of each pixel and then uh, basically uh, let's let's, just see, let's change the this I'd like to see the, the pen so somehow we project this triangle into the this camera uh, into the image space and then uh, uh, then the restoration nothing but if the this the center of the pixel is located we, inside of this triangle we compute some color we actually get the color of the, this triangle. And then also, if we do the illumination, we uh, we also consider light, uh, how much energy uh, each uh, each uh, uh, how much energy this uh, little uh, space receive from the light source, and then we compute color. And then uh, and we do the, this process for each pixel, and then and then we compute this the color buffer, and then we visualize it this buffer into the this the, uh, 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 into the this uh, uh, monitor. So basically, the, the rendering pipeline, also known as the rasterization, has uh, many steps. So as you can see, it has a lot of steps, but it's not the intuitive, right? So basically, the rendering pipeline, it's not 
design in an intuitive way. It doesn't mimic the actual uh, light and material interaction. It just uh, design in a way to get a best, uh, to get a very efficient processing, uh, uh, to get a very fast performance of the the rendering this triangle. So basically, this is the, the rendering pipeline designed in a, designed for the achieving the very high performance. In the long term ago, once we had this the initial set of computer graphics, we, we actually had a, we didn't we didn't have the GPU. I mean we have to use the CPU, but there are many triangles or there are many pixels, so the even rasterizing one triangle takes a lot of time. So that's why achieving high performance is very, very important. That's why we actually had a lot of the complicated steps. As I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned before, the main reason, the uh, main reason why we are using rasterization is the efficiency, and also the, based on these steps, we can actually get a reasonably good quality, uh, a reasonably good visual quality. So also, the uh, uh, the rasterization, rasterizing this triangle takes a lot of time. GPU actually has been evolved, has been introduced and evolved to uh, to accelerate this rasterization pipeline. So actually, this is the uh, uh, Fermi GPU architecture. So basically, it uh, actually it, it is introduced a few years ago, but still the recent GPU architecture actually there also there has the same uh, same idea. So basically, the, there are, uh, you can see there are uh, many these green box, right? This green box actually nothing but very small. Uh, 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 you can treat that this little box, this green box, which is like the small CPU core. Actually, this actually CUDA core. CUDA is actually the, uh, some language for the uh, language for uh, the using the, the GPU. And uh, uh, as you can see, there are a lot, lots of lots of core. So actually, we can we can process the we can actually parallel we can parallel we can parallelly processing this the rasterization rasterizing triangle. As you can see, when we actually rasterizing one triangle, uh, also that process actually independent of the rasterizing another triangle. So so that actually we can use there are lots of these parallel operations. So uh, that's why we can use the this the uh, 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 many cores, and by using the many cores, we can actually achieve the high performance. This the Turing architecture introduced, uh, introduced uh, 2018. Actually, the basically this is actually chip area, so it combined the shade. Basically, you can see that shade is nothing but illumination of the rasterization. Also, compute some of the you know the we can also using the M, uh, NVIDIA this uh, uh, GPU chip for the arbitrary operation. Back then, uh, uh, the GP only designed to only the design to perform the this the rasterization process. But uh, once we get a more uh, uh, once we get a more this power under the chip, we can also uh, we can also have we can also have some sort of this pro programmable function so that we can we can use the some of the some of the module of the GPU chip to compute the arbitrary operations like the uh, like CPU. Also, there are uh, you can see the shade and compute they combine together, and tensor core actually this is the mainly for the this compute, and also you can see the uh, tensor core also the uh, also this main design for the AI, uh, a lot uh, uh, large of the actually machine learning technique also using the this uh, some uh, some of the uh, AI operations has some com a common pattern, so it also using the some of tensor operation that's why actually it has a name of tensor core. So as you can see, MB, the, actually this NVIDIA chip GPU evolved to support the, even the this machine learning operations. This is also the ray tracing become the, uh, be, uh, uh, becoming more common and common to be used in the many applications. So actually some, some of the dedicated area uh, designed uh, used for the performing uh, the, uh, solving, uh, uh, solving these ray tracing operations. As you can see, GPU evolved into the many different directions. Starting from the, this, the rendering rendering pipeline, which is actually very fixed, a very simple setup. Also, last year, Ampere architecture uh, was introduced uh, from the NVIDIA, uh, but essentially they follow the uh, same uh, same mm -hmm. architecture of the uh, of the, the prior uh, prior one. Basically, it has a more core, fast computation than Turing architecture. Uh, here uh, I'm showing the image of some of the uh, some of the game, the uh, battlefield. But as you can see, the, even though the rasterization does not uh, does not simulate the actual physical and uh, actual light and material material physical interaction, it actually has been evolved a lot to support the various realistic artifacts. Uh, uh, as you can see, 
you can see that there's some of the motion blur and some of the uh, this uh, deep focus here and there, and you can see the very uh, realistic illuminations. But still, there are lots of the other effects that cannot be supported well by the uh, rasterization. You can, if you look at this simple, actually this is known as corner box, uh, you, you can see that there are some scene and light and some box. You can see the spear, also spear actually looks like the mirror. There are very soft shadow. Uh, you can see that there are area lights, so they actually, uh, uh, basically we have the very soft, sh uh, soft shadow here. You can even see that this kind of the, the color bleeding here. Basically, the, this, this is actually green wall and uh, we uh, somehow the, this flow and also the uh, 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 kind of the, this uh, uh, reflecting uh, some of the light uh, light energy. That's why also you can see that some of the this uh, green uh, green green wall here on the floor. Some people say that it's actually color bleeding, but ba basically this is kind of the rendering effect that cannot be supported very well by the rasterization. Rasterization actually they're very good for just the, given this triangle. Rasterization is nothing but project is trying into the uh, uh, image space and rasterize it. That's it. So basically, if you can see the, some of the uh, triangle in a direct way, we can actually the handle that, uh, that uh, we can actually rasterize that triangle very well. But if you have a lot of complicated scene, basically the, this, when you are rasterizing this one, this, the, this triangle does not have the green color. The, the main reason why we actually see the green color here is that the light actually interact. Uh, the light actually photon emitting from light source hitting there, and then the photon reflect from the wall, and it has a green, uh, green color at that time. And then the the, the photon hitting the, the floor, then we can see the green color. So it has actually lots of lots of the global operations, and then the rasterization pipeline is not designed to support that kind of the complicated the uh, interaction. In, uh, basically, that's indirect reflection that I will talk about later on. So that's why it's the limiting fact, limiting issue of the rasterization. That's the one of reason why we need to why we need to use the uh, ray tracing. So uh, initially, the ray tracing is starting from the ray casting, and then ray tracing nothing but we just using the ray casting in a recursive way. So that's why I use the recursive ray casting here. Uh, it, it's idea actually the gained popularity around 1980, long time ago, by the turn of it. Did. Uh, basically, by using the rate initial initial setting of the rate casting, uh, the recursive rate uh, rate casting or rate tracing, we can support the, this kind of shadow, soft shadow. We can also support the, this kind of the, uh, transparent uh, transparent rendering. Some of texture actually reflects the here, and then we can see through the uh, we can see that this texture through the, this kind of transparent sphere. Let me briefly talk about the, some of the main idea of the rate casting and rate tracing. Uh, they're basically, the uh, rate. Uh, I think that it's better. Uh, uh, it's better to talk about this one with the, uh, with some illustration that I will talk about later on. The base algorithm is that we actually uh, this actually the camera this uh, this actually image space that we this actually image that we want to compute, and this is the little box is actually pixel, and then we generate ray. Uh, uh, we can generate a ray that passing through the center of each pixel. And then basically this, we in, in other words, basically it's nothing but ray casting. We cast a ray, and then if the ray hitting there in some of the object, then we comp we get the color of that object that intersect with the ray, uh, put the color into here. That's it. That's the basic algorithm of ray casting. And basically the the rasterize is nothing but uh, uh, if we do the ray casting, we can get a, uh, we can get a, uh, we can get the image that are computed computed by the rasterization. Rasterization nothing but we just uh, transform, we, we just uh, project this triangle into the into the, this image space, and then we compute the color for each pixel, right? The, if we do the ray casting, that's the essentially same thing with the ray uh, rasterization. Main difference is that ray casting, uh, the rasterization is that we project the triangle from the 3D space into 2D, but the, uh, in the in the in the case of the ray tracing, ray casting is that we generate ray from the the, the camera origin to the uh, to the center of the pixel. And, we inter and then we, we get the intersection point between ray and object. So basically, ray is nothing but we can treat the ray as a, the a trajectory of the photon. Photon emitting from the, in this case, actually, the uh, usually photon uh, emitted from the light source, but the, uh, 
uh, basically we actually the, that's why we do the backward ray tracing ray casting we emit the ray from the camera passing through the center of the, the center of each pixel that's the basic ray casting and then if we want to support the shadow then we do the ray casting here and then uh, if we want to support the ray uh, the shadow then obviously the, we need to know the, whether we can get the light and en light energy from the uh, light source or not to do that we generate another ray from here from the intersection point between the this the, of uh, this the, uh, initial ray also known as this primary ray and then this intersection uh, uh, of the distributed scene here we generate another uh, another ray known as this shadow ray or the or the, the secondary ray this primary ray and the secondary ray and then from there this heat point into the this the, uh, light source direct light source direction so here this this actual shadow ray or the secondary ray at that case at that point if we generate ray and then the secondary ray may be the blocked by the this object right so we don't get energy from light source so we got the very uh, dark energy here dark color but at that point uh, along the uh, uh, on this scene we got the uh, light uh, we got the ray here and then we generate another secondary ray from that point the light source we can get light energy right so that we got the we actually adding the uh, some color from the light source so that's why it looks bright and looks dark so supporting the shadow is very simple by generating just another ray and basically this ray tracing since we recursively perform you generating ray and then performing the ray intersection test between the ray and the 3D scene reflection and uh, if we uh, support the, if we want to support the, this kind uh, this this object like the metal or the mirror and the, it actually reflect the, the uh, it, uh, uh, it reflected the surrounding scene to do that to support this kind of reflection effect we simply generate another ray another secondary ray uh, uh, another secondary reflection ray primary ray and then this is a reflection uh, uh, some of the mirror then we generated uh, we generate another this the reflection ray so at that case actually the uh, depending on the ge geometry uh, support the this actual mirror then if if the mirror actually they're supporting this uh, perfect uh, uh, if the mirror is actually perfect perfect specular we we uh, 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 we, uh, we actually com we can compute this kind of the uh, reflection ray direction uh, based on the, the Snell's law I'm not going to talk about the details about Snell's law, but if you're interested, you can look at my book and look at the, this uh, check uh, uh, find the Snell's law. Based on that, we can compute this reflection ray. And then, then this ref uh, reflection ray here it is the floor. Then we get the color from the, the floor. Uh, this the floor is nothing but in this case checkbox. Uh, and then put the color here, and then uh, uh, we translate. Uh, we actually transfer the color from here, from here to there, or here to this pixel. So we can get this kind of uh, image here. Okay, let's talk about refraction. So in this case, actually, this object uh, is the transparent. So uh, we can see through the, this, the other objects uh, from the, this, uh, this transparent object. You can see that actually this, uh, this cylinder uh, is kind of glass. So in this case, if the object is transparent, it is the primary ray intersects with the transparent object. We generate another secondary uh, refractive ray that passing through the, this transparent object. And then in this case, uh, this secondary ray hit it there and then also it also reflected to the, this, uh, this uh, floor. So that's how we can see through the, this, uh, this checkerboard uh, seen through the, this uh, transparent object. So uh, here uh, you might recall that this is actually a phone illumination model that we use for the rasterization. I will talk about this ambient diffuse specular terms. I will talk about it later on. This actual original fit tunnel fitted the uh, model. Uh, it also has an ambient diffuse term, but the, uh, here uh, this uh, this actually the uh, some color light energy from the shadow. Uh, uh, basically, this uh, this S from uh, this S from the uh, S from the actually uh, reflection, not shadow reflection. Uh, if the model is also the transparent, uh, this is a color from the, this uh, transparent ray. And then this KS, KT is actually specular and trans, uh, transmission. You can see the transmission is transparent object. Uh, the K, KS, KT are trans specular uh, and transmission coefficient depend, that, are de that are decided depending on the different object. And then uh, based, uh, if the object is the, uh, not uh, 
is uh, basically the, the common object, then we can only consider ambient diffuse. And this also the, the specular that we generate another secondary ray, and we consider that uh, another uh, light energy from the that uh, the specular object. So uh, initial tunnel model uh, has the very similar to a phone illumination model. Uh, it also has this the additional term that are depending on the this uh, depending on the secondary ray. Uh, here, uh, this is actually the uh, open gel phone illumination, illumination model. This ambient term, the ambient is just a general background uh, color. Uh, there are a lot, uh, basically, you can treat that this simple hack that's supporting the, there are many indirect, in, uh, indirect uh, interaction between photon and materials. We cannot consider that complicated the, uh, interaction, so we're just using, using some constant one for the ambient. This diffuse, if the model is diffuse, then depending on the, this, the, uh, depending on the angle, uh, angle between the light source and uh, object, uh, object, uh, object, this normal vector, we can compute the, some color. The specular the object is somehow specular, uh, and then the specular uh, the direction is the, uh, close to the, our, our, our viewing angle. We got the highlight, and if we combine ambient diffuse specular term, we can get the, this kind of the nice uh, uh, Im uh, image. You can see that it looks like plastic, so that's why uh, the, uh, one of the initial the, uh, this the long uh, the initial this movie is actually the Pixar Toy Story. You can see that in the Toy Story there are many plastic object character, right? So phone illumination model supports the plastic very well, so that <laughs> we generate that kind of the movie based on the, this, the at that time the, the uh, uh, technical skill. Uh, one thing that I, I'd like to talk about is that the ray tracing actually generate lots of lots of ray. Suppose that here we have eye, uh, uh, in other words, camera, and we generate primary ray that passing through the center of this pixel, and then this ray intersect with the, some of the box here. And then if we want to know that whether we can, uh, whether uh, at that region we are in the shadow or not, we need to generate another, uh, another the secondary the shadow ray from here to the light source. And then if the model, uh, model is the uh, kind of uh, uh, mirror-like one, then we need to generate the, the secondary ref, uh, reflection ray here. And also we need to generate another secondary ray. And if this model is transparent, we also need, we, we can also generate uh, another sec secondary this uh, refraction way here, and then we can keep doing that. So basically, the the way uh, the way of generating rays starting from the primary ray can be represented uh, as a, this uh, uh, some sort of ray, uh, some sort of tree. So this is actually primary primary ray here, and we generate shadow ray, uh, refraction ray R, also this uh, transmission. Uh, uh, in other words, it's a uh, refraction ray, and then we keep doing that until we're hitting the digital light source. So basically the early on ray tracing generate uh, text uh, generate lot, need to generate lots of uh, ray and then thus it requires a lot of time. So rendering time for a ray tracer depends on the number of ray intersection tests for each pixel. And then uh, then uh, basically the, uh, to generate this kind of image, uh, we need to generate the number of the pixels also, there we need to multiply the, uh, this one with the number of primitive in the scene. Basically, there we need uh, to perform the uh, intersection test. We need to check the intersection between each ray and and another uh, uh, every single of the this triangle that con that uh, that consists of this scene. So, if we have the more triangle, more pixel, it require lots of lots of uh, uh, lots of lots of ray. And in in each pixel, also we need to generate uh, this the shadow ray, uh, also this many the secondary rays. And then, uh, so basically, all the all the efforts for the improving ray tracing has been uh, focused on the accelerating ray uh, ray object intersection test. And there are lots of techniques for the uh, accelerated accelerated technique for the ray triangle intersection test. We are not going to talk about low level detail here. If you if you want to know uh, if you want to know the some of the low level detail, you can actually refer to the my book. Uh, but some uh, here I'd like to talk about some of the advanced technique. Uh, to accelerate the ray tracing. So here, uh, one of the very well-known techniques is actually the uh, bounding volume hierarchy or the spatial subdivision technique like the K3. I'll mainly talk about uh, the bounding volume hierarchy. So the, uh, suppose that here we have the I and we need to generate some of ray and then we need to check the intersection test between this ray and uh, every single uh, triangle that consists, that consists of this teapot model. 
And then one of the very simple extraction techniques is that using the this bounding volume. Bounding volume simply enclose this complex object with a very simple to uh, simple simple object. In other words, the simple to intersect object. In this case, we used this spear. And then uh, uh, you can see that uh, intuitively, actually, you can see that uh, it may be more easier. It may be more simple to it may be simple to check the intersection test between this ray. In other words, uh, line also this uh, this spear. And if 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 there's no uh, if there's no intersection between this ray and also this enclosing bounding volume, then we don't need to check the we don't need to check the this the uh, the in, uh, intersection test between this ray and every single triangle that are contained in this sphere. So that's why we can actually accelerate this performance. Of course, if we actually have intersection test between uh, intersection between the ray and this uh, bounding volume. Then we need to localize the, the actual location of the having the intersection test. So we need to check the this uh, every single ray and triangle intersection test. But uh, uh, anyway, so one of the uh, there are some of the very well known bounding volumes like the sphere, also this axis aligned the bounding box. So basically, this is just box aligned uh, and each axis aligned with x, y, z, the common this uh, common the canonical axis. But you can see that the sphere is very simple, but not that tight. In other words, suppose that even uh, I mean, the, if the ray actually intersects in at that direction, even though there's no intersection test between the object and the ray, but the, the sphere is very loose, so that uh, there's uh, some intersection between uh, 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 there's some inter intersection against the sphere, then we need to do the this the uh, uh, low level ray and triangle intersection test. Uh, also, sometimes axis aligned bounding box actually perform better. But it depends on the scene. Sometimes sphere is better and axis aligned bounding box is better. Now here I only talk about sphere and axis aligned bounding box given this uh, some of the object. This is a computer sphere and this computed uh, bounding box. Well, there are more advanced techniques like the oriented bounding box. So here the uh, each axis actually computed uh, computed along the this uh, compute along the geometry containing the bounding box. Also, there are more advanced ones. KDOPS actually it it computer every single plane that including the including the object, but the, uh, it, it may be the more complex object like uh, other than this box. So it actually it, it obviously using this slab and oriented line box much more uh, expensive than using the uh, using the this the simple object simple bounding volume like a sphere. But uh, uh, by using these complex bounding volumes, we hope that it, it is actually more tighter. Uh, uh, this computer, uh, computer bounding volume actually tightly fitting the underlying geometry. Uh, another, another simple uh, acceleration of the just using bounding volume is the bounding volume hierarchy. Computer scientists uh, actually uh, I, uh, like the idea of the using the hierarchy, right, tree? So uh, it essentially organized bounding volume as a tree. So here I will just uh, give some illustration here. It's given a way. Uh, uh, we actually compute the bounding uh, bounding volume for each model, uh, for each uh, for each object here. Actually, we use the box, and then uh, some, uh, somehow we, we actually partition the, this uh, this uh, uh, kind of low, uh, and then this uh, this uh, every uh, the each bounding volume for each object actually uh, serve as a uh, serve as a, the leaf uh, leaf bounding volume of the tree, and then. Then we actually merge some of the uh, uh, nearby bounding volume and compute this more bigger bounding volume. So in this in these two objects, we build the more bigger one. For this, we build the more, more bigger one. And then uh, then uh, this actually uh, com uh, this bounding volume located here. This bounding located here. And also we we actually merge every bounding volume and compute this bounding uh, this the biggest bounding volume and solve at the root of this bounding volume hierarchy. This is a bounding volume hierarchy. In other words. Uh, basically, we enclose the, this the underlying geometry in a, a recursive way. And then, how, how can we use this bounding volume hierarchy? So, given the ray, we first check the intersection. We first check inter intersection between this ray and root bounding volume here. And if there's no intersection, then we, we don't need to traverse the, this tree, right? There's no intersection test. Uh, we, we know that there's no, in, no intersection between this ray and underlying geometry. But if there is an uh, intersection here, uh, as we shown here, then we need to refine this uh, top node into the uh, into the child uh, uh, child node here. In this case, these are the bounding volume. Then we uh, we check the intersection test between the ray and every this uh, child node. And then we don't have uh, we don't, in this case we don't have the no intersection between the ray and this box. Then we skip the traversing this this one. And then 
uh, in this case, we actually have an intersection here. Then uh, we are also the refine this node into the children node, or, or, or the, if there's no children uh, children bounded volume, we need to uh, we need to actually check the intersection test between Ray and every single triangle contained in this uh, leaf node. So basically, there we travel to to use this bounded volume hierarchy for intersection test. We traverse a tree. And then, depending on the whether we have collision or not, uh, intersection or not, we traverse the the tree uh, uh, deeper down or not. By using the bounding volume hierarchy, we can actually accelerate the uh, the runtime performance of ray tracing over the just using uh, just the using naively checking every single test between ray and then every uh, every single triangle. So actually, there also the, I'm also the one of the researcher actually introduced a uh, proposed to use the bounding volume hierarchy for ray tracing, uh, especially for the dynamic dynamically moving models. I actually in, uh, we uh, I worked together with my uh, 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 with my junior students at the 2006, and then uh, somehow the, um, uh, 10 years later, this paper actually uh, was uh, 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 this paper actually was recognized as one of the uh, uh, one of the influential technique using the the acceleration uh, acceleration structure like the bounding volume hierarchy for accelerating ray tracing. So, 2015 I got that is the test test of time award. It means that even though 10 years passed away, this technique actually was uh, used a lot in the field. And another uh, technique is actually the another acceleration structure is, is known as the spatial subdivision. I'm not going to talk about details. In other words, you don't also there, you don't need to spend uh, much time to understand this one. But before in the bounding volume hierarchy, we we actually partition the object triangle to build a hierarchy. But in other words, we can actually partition the, the space to build a hierarchy. So regular grid, arc tree, BS, BSP tree, KD tree uh, are the some of the examples. But I'm not going to talk about the details about here since in the bounding volume hierarchy, all that, uh, it's just understanding bounding volume hierarchy is uh, enough for you. So in summary, classic ray tracing is kind of gathering approach. We actually generate ray and then we generate a lot of secondary ray and then uh, uh, then we actually gather energy from the light source and ref uh, reflected ray and also, also the uh, refracted uh, directions. Its concept is very simple. Also, it provides uh, improved realism over the classical rendering pipeline, the uh, rasterization scheme. But still, it's a very simple light model. As you can see, this uh, this uh, general image look uh, looks very naive, right? It's a simple light model material. Also, this uh, light propagation. In in the end, it's not a complete solution. And then I will, we will talk about more better solution later on. Also, back then uh, we don't have any accelerated any this special hardware, uh, special uh, specially designed hardware for the ray tracing. So we have to use CPU, but the CPU was very slow to. Uh, to process this uh, lots of lots of rays. So early on, ray, ray tracing was proposed, uh, proposed early on, but it was not used uh, actively. So there, basically, there, uh, uh, we start with some of problem with the classic ray tracing. It's not really uh, not realistic. Also, if you, uh, it's also view dependent. In other words, when you change the view, we have to generate the ray uh, uh, again for the, uh, this the view. <coughs> and uh, later on, this uh, radiosity concept actually was proposed. It's actually the it will support the uh, global illumination, but it assumed on it assumed this diffuse scene. But you can actually provide a very nice image on assuming the diffuse scene. And then uh, uh, 1986, we actually had uh, this Monte Carlo ray tracing. It's a global illumination for any environment. Actually, this Monte Carlo ray tracing was known as the path tracing. And this technique actually the proposed long time ago. Uh, studied a lot, and then sometimes actually it also dismissed. But uh, basically, this is kind of method of choice used uh, that are that are that are under using in many applications, like for the uh, generating realistic movie, uh, uh, even in recent days. So basically, the uh, the technique is nice. Also, the uh, the recent GPU actually accelerated this the performance of this the, uh, this uh, ray tracing technique, Monte Carlo ray tracing technique. The understanding of Monte Carlo ray tracing is one of the main uh, main topic of the discourse. And also, the ray tracing has been studied a lot, and so there are actually many ray tracing engines. Uh, uh, also, I would say uh, ray tracing kernels. Nvidia also provides uh, these Optics X that utilize the GPU, computing architecture, and CUDA. 
was introduced uh, Intel also introduced Embry it's just using the common CPU multi-threaded and CMD so obviously the the uh, MB, the optics X actually shows the better performance than the uh, Embry one but if you don't have the the uh the some of the recent GPU that that can run the optics X you can try it out Embry and then I recommend you to try it out uh, these uh these ray tracing engines so that you can see the uh, what kind of render effect it can support and what, what kind of performance it can have. And then, so you might heard about OpenGL, also the DirectX. Those, li uh, those libraries kind of stand out of the uh, performing rasterization. And then uh, this NVIDIA and Intel actually, they're working together to make the, their rendering their ray tracing engine as uh, some of the, uh, some of the, these, the common, uh, common standard engine like the OpenGL. They might come later on. Uh, also, to help you to understand the better this the ray tracing engine, uh, I'd like to give you the, uh, our first programming assignment, PA1. So basically, the, it's, the, uh, it's a kind of easy homework. You need to get to know the Optics, Optics X or the Embry. Just download and compile either one of the, those two methods. I, I think that there are already compiled version in, uh, 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 at the website. Also, the try it out a few scenes and upload some of the image of those scenes in the KLMS. Uh, the specific deadline will be available at the KLMS, so just just try it out the uh, those rendering engines and then just just play with them and then uh, upload some of the image. It's easy one, but sometimes it may take some uh, it may it may require some of the linking or compilation. There might be some un, uh, un, uh, there might be some unexpected issues, so I recommend you start early. Uh, this is just just general homework. Go over the next lecture slide before the class. And then watch two paper or video. You don't need to go over the, the details of the paper. Just watch the video and see the what other the the tech what other actually topics and techniques of the uh, recent techniques and submit your summary uh, 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 before, right before the every Monday class. Just one paragraph for each summary is okay. You can use the English or the Korean. So I wish that by now you can understand the basic ray tracing. Uh, basically, the, if you need uh, some effect, just, just generate a way and then note each expression data structure like bounding volume hierarchy and how to use the uh, hierarchy also the recent uh, rendering engine. And next time I will talk about radiosity, which is another uh, important uh, rendering, uh, uh, rendering scheme uh, for the global illumination. Okay, uh, that's it. See you later. Bye.